Hey, welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man that wants everyone to know that behind every carefully written grocery list is a confused husband. <laughs> it's Dale. Ain't that the damn truth? Yeah. But of course, you know, many times I've been, I know where everything is if I go to my grocery store. Yeah. What sucks is when you go to one you don't go to often, you can't find anything. You can't find nothing. Shouldn't uh, it be some kind of universal code between these places? You would think, I, hey, but at least Dollar General did get their act together and make all their stores the same, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Except the one around here, and you can't walk through it because it's so damn cluttered. It looks like a bomb went off in it. <laughs> it does. It's awful. What's going on with you, dude? Oh, man, trying to get over another day gum cold, but I think I'm all right. Well, it sounds like you're on the mend. Yeah, yeah, feeling pretty good this morning. Well, good. Ready to get the year started off, man. I think we can do some kick butt stuff this year. Twenty twenty two, and we have that, got some stuff lined up. We've got some interviews coming, and we do man, and some um, other cases we want to cover. I hope you guys dig their interviews. We we really have a good time with those. Yeah, and pretty notable people, I think. Mm-hmm. A little thing you might be shocked. Yeah, could be. You got any good shout outs for us? Yeah, we're gonna shout out to our buddy old Rich Adams, man. He keeps on just keeping on, man. We uh, appreciate. He gave us a. Apple Podcast five star review, and he was one of the first to jump on the Spotify and give us a five star review there too. So we really appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, absolutely, we appreciate you, Rich. And if you haven't done that or didn't know, but now you can go on your Spotify and they have a review button uh, right on their homepage. Yep, click that five star on Spotify. Yeah, appreciate you. And if any podcast platform you listen to allows it, click that five star. Yeah, it really helps us out, whether you believe it or not. It really does. And go to the website, get you a t shirt. Order you something cool, and we're going to try to get some more merch and T-shirt designs on the website. Yes, definitely. Get, get that going, too. You get some cool stuff, man. Yep. And, Dale, we're just two minutes into our podcast. We're going to piss somebody off. <laughs> well, we might as well start the new year off, right? Yep. Piss somebody off. But uh, we're going to get into our case this week, dude. All right, man. What we got going on today? We have a missing person, and really, our missing person episodes seem to do pretty well. Yeah. I think people are interested in that stuff. I think so, too. But this is uh, the disappearance of Susan Walsh. Susan Walsh. And just a little bit of background on Susan Walsh. She was born Susan Young on February the 18th, 1960, in Wayne, New Jersey. Susan Young. Yep. Is she part of the ACDC clan? No. Okay. But she's part of the uh, (laughs) Walsh clan. We'll get into that a little bit later. Okay. Now, Susan, from her childhood, she wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. I think from the, I saw or read from like the age of 10. Yeah, or earlier. Yeah, she wanted to be a poet. Yep. And she wanted to be a writer, poet, pretty bad. And everything I've seen, too, that her childhood was pretty troubled. Yeah, I think her mom passed away pretty early. Her dad remarried several times, so I'm sure there's some some difficulties there to deal with. Yeah, probably back and forth between maybe dad and a grandparent or something, and yeah. Yeah. I I can imagine it wasn't stable at all. Right. Yeah. But we don't have much information on her her younger life or anything like that. But in the 1980s, she did attend college at William Patterson College, and this is where she started working as a stripper to finance her education deal. Yeah. And she also became heavily involved in drugs and alcohol. Uh, kind of comes along with the job there, probably. Yeah, probably just, we talked about this off the air a little bit, and yeah. probably just to numb yourself or right to get away, escape. Yeah, get out of the life. reality of what you're doing, yeah. Yep. To me, I don't that's what I would think. But she was working as a stripper to finance her education at William Patterson College. And by the time she graduated college in 1984, she attended rehab and got sober so that's pretty good yep and she stayed sober for about 11 and a half years yeah which was really good very good i think her life had changed a little bit she graduated college and she married a man named mark walsh and in 1988 she gave birth to their first son david right and everybody talks about this just to talk about a little bit about mark walsh he happened to be the half brother to Joe Walsh. Yeah. Of Eagles thing. Of the Eagles. Uh, James Gang. Yep. Mm-hmm. And um, Joe Walsh happens to be brother in law to Ringo Starr. Well, yeah. About that. So we, we ain't going to get into them. But uh, she was married to Mark Walsh. Just so. a little name dropping going on. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but even though, you know, Susan got married, had a kid, she never forgot about her dream of becoming a writer. Right. And she started working as a journalist and started out writing for a scientific trade journals. And I'd read that that maybe this was her father-in-law that worked for 
the scientific journals, and he got her a job doing that. Yeah, he had some connections. Yeah. Yeah. And by the early 1990s, Susan and Mark's marriage started going south. Mm. And they split up. Well, yep. That ain't good. No, but yeah. Mark continued to live in the same apartment building as Susan, but on a different floor. Right. Yeah, I think it was a big building that like, had been converted into apartments. You know? and so like one of those where you can walk into the front door and look around, but then all the apartments are all separate. So it's not like a, like a basically just an apartment apartment. Yeah, but it wasn't a high class apartment. It no. was a pretty much yeah a rundown tenement. So it wasn't nothing fancy at all. Right. But uh, Susan started dancing again, in a way to support her son because I don't think Mark was helping at all. Don't tell like it. I mean, there's no not much information on it. I mean, what was he like a house painter and musician, part time musician or something? So yeah. I'm sure he wasn't raking it in either. No. So uh, yeah, I don't think so. I didn't find out anything else about how much or he contributed or he did not contribute either way. Actually. They agreed just basically to on this living condition, you know, where they stayed in the same building so they could both help each other out with the with their son. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that was and he watched the son while I guess she went to work and done different things like that. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah. So I guess basically he worked during the day and she worked during the night, probably. Yeah. But Susan was working as a stripper to help boost her journalism career. Right. And she obtained an internship at the Village Voice. Village Voice. Yeah. Well, first thing pops in your mind when you hear that. Ace Fraley applying to a ad put in by Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons for Kiss. Ain't that the truth? Yep. First thing I thought of, too. <laughs> yep. But she did get an internship at the Village Voice, and that is an independent New York City newspaper. Right. Now, I'm sure internships don't pay anything, right? No. Unless you get something published or a writer. So. Yeah, it's just when you do something, you get paid. Right. It's not like a, a full-time job. Right. But she used her connections there in, in the stripping industry to help expose a story about Russian mobsters. And, Dale, this was forcing young women to work and live like slaves in the New York City strip clubs. Yeah, you know, and it's kind of ironic that whatever she was doing to make a living would also it'd come into play to help her with her journalism, you know. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think uh, these guys were uh, basically having these. And some of these girls were classically trained dancers. but Ballet dancers. Yeah, they, they thought they were coming here to dance, and they got over here, and they ended up having to be strippers and do sex work and this kind of thing yeah. under the Russian mob. Yeah, wasn't good at all. No. But this article did earn Susan critical praise. And James Ridgway, he was the uh, Susan's boss at the Village Voice. He described Susan as a, an incredibly hard worker who went to the extreme lengths to cover any story. Yeah, spent hours and hours and hours researching and doing stuff and even going to these clubs and undercover or whatever, trying to find more details than anybody else could get. Yep. But Susan, she got paranoid after this article. And she claimed and she told friends and others that she believed that she was being stalked. It could be. Mm -hmm. And Susan apparently received threats following the article and also believed that she was being followed. The article was successful, but after the article about the Russian mob, Susan went on to investigate uh, the vampire subculture in New York City. Now, this is pretty strange to me, but I remember when all this was popping up back in the early 90s, I think it was, mm -hmm. all this vampire cult sex yeah. club blood drinking kind of mess <laughs> yeah but susan became i think pretty entranced by this by this subculture and and she began dating a man who was believed to be a vampire yeah he said he was yeah <laughs> and his name was christian peppo and he was like 21 yeah he was several years younger than her yeah but she was writing an article on this subculture of the vampires and she submitted the article to the village voice but it was rejected right well, they, they thought she had got in too deep and was just basically believing anything these people told her, you know, as far as people getting killed or them stealing blood from hospitals or whatever came up. They just, they wasn't buying what she was selling. Yeah. Could have been one-sided on her part, maybe. Right. Yeah. Being she had gotten in too deep and was just believing anything. Yeah, but the article was rejected. Mm -hmm. And at this point, Susan went back to dancing full-time. Got to pay the bills, man. That's it. Now, we're going to get just... Right before her disappearance, Dale, we're going to talk about, a little bit about this. Just shortly before her disappearance, Susan appeared in a documentary, and it was called Stripped. And it was produced by a friend of hers and filmmaker named Jill Morley. Right. And just a little bit of shout-out on Jill Morley. Um, I have emailed her, and she's agreed to do an interview with us in the future. Oh, cool. Very cool. Shout-out, Jill. Appreciate it. Yep. But in the interview, 
uh, Susan speaks of a stalker. Yeah, I think, uh, what was it, where uh, her uh, pager goes off. Yeah. And she goes, just says, basically, that's probably my stalker, and everybody laughs, and she ain't laughing. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, no, I'm not kidding. And I've seen that part in it, and it's like after the pager goes off, her attitude changes in the conversation. Mm-hmm. It's totally different. So she could have had a stalker. Well, I'm sure. I mean, in working in that industry, I'm sure there's a lots of stalkers. But Susan speaks of a stalker and makes reference to a recent relapse from sobriety. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, I think when you get into that into that job, man, I just don't see how you could not do that, truthfully. But in Susan's life, her health wasn't that great. No. But she had emphysema, uh, a stomach ulcer. Mm-hmm. And she, some bronchitis, she said. Yeah, and she even says in the interview that she had spent hospital time two weeks before this interview, I think she was yep. in the hospital twice. Yeah, yep, that's what she said. Mm-hmm. And was even taking medication for bipolar disorder. Yeah. So she's she's in a pretty rough way. Yeah. And then plus getting her her journalism kind of shut down on her, on, on her and then uh, having to go right back into this work. Yeah. I'm sure she wasn't looking forward to that. Uh, and even Jill Morley even states that she knew Susan had stopped taking medication for her bipolar mm. in 1996. It's not good either. No. And Jill also states that she believes Susan was using Xanax during this time period. And most of it's not good. Yep. Uh, James Ridgway, he was Susan's boss at the Village Voice, and he even said that uh, he noted symptoms of mental instability in Susan. Mm. And uh, apparently noted that Susan's wrist were bandaged at some point in 1996. Yeah, there was a book that came out and said that uh, she was having a, like a signing of one that she had done a lot of research for mm-hmm. for book and it was at one of the signings he noticed that the, the bandages on the wrist and he was thinking maybe she had tried to try to kill herself or some kind of self-harm or something right but i don't know if she's living with the vampire guy up here I'm, that's what i was thinking it was something more towards that mm-hmm. you know just dabbling in that vampirism stuff yeah that's what i think mm-hmm. i may be wrong hmm. ain't no telling that one makes more sense to me because i don't think you know, especially living with her son, that she's going to do that. I don't think she wanted to leave her son like her mom left her, you know. I mean, I'm, yeah. I don't know what happened to her mom, but she knows what it was like to come up without your mom, and I don't think, you know, that she would do that purposely to her son. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong. But, but uh, Jill and I had emailed back and forth a couple times, and she stated that Susan was an excellent mother. Right. And would have never done anything to leave her son. or Right, yeah, so that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. James Ridgeway, the boss at the Village Voice, confronted Susan about her drugs and alcohol use, and she brushed him off as, you know, that she would seek help if needed. Yeah, he was trying to get her to go back to AA because he knew she was backsliding pretty bad. And I'm, I'm assuming this has a lot to do with her having to go back into stripping. But uh, she just kind of told him, if I need help, I'll go get it. Yeah. So what can you do? But during this time, Susan also had a history of volatile and inconsistent relationship with with men. And like we talked about, uh, she was involved with this Christian Pepo. He was 21, and he was living with her yeah. in that apartment. Right. But he uh, claimed to be a vampire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I tried to find this guy. I can't find anything on him. I couldn't either. And one of Susan's prior boyfriends was apparently obsessed with her and had gotten into a physical altercation with Christian Pepo. Yeah, it like he beat him up or something. And I think he showed up at the apartment, and they had a restraining order against him. Yeah not good but in the days before susan's disappearance friends and others would say that her behavior was more and more erratic she got to be more paranoid and she was in poor physical health and her loved ones even feared that she was emotionally unstable i mean this is going to be a a pretty steep downward spiral i think you know especially she's off her meds getting back into drugs all everything's falling apart her writing is Pretty much in the, in the garbage. Yeah, she's not getting any writing jobs. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. All right, Dale. We're going to get up to the day that Susan disappeared, and this was on July the 26th, 1996, around noon. And this is when Susan left her apartment to make a phone call, and she left their 11-year-old son, David, with her ex-husband, Mark. Yeah, I think she just she stopped by because his, his apartment was downstairs or the basement apartment or whatever in this building, and took him down there. Now, he had a phone. And he would let her use the phone, but only if he knew who she was calling and what she was calling about. I don't think he let her use it if she was going to call strip 
clubs or, or booking agents. Drugs. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of stuff. I, yeah. I think that was more probably what it was is if she was trying to score drugs or whatever. But anyway, she so she just left the bar and said she had to go make a few phone calls to a and there was a like a, a pay phone just down the street from where they live, so she had used pretty pretty often. Mm-hmm. So she said, I just got to make a few phone calls. And he said, you're going to be back pretty soon. She goes, yeah, I'm just going to make a few phone calls, and then I'll be back. Mm-hmm. But she never came back. Said she was going to go call um, her agent who got her uh, dancing jobs, but it was also rumored that this same agent was also a supplier for drugs. Mm-hmm. So you could call him to get whatever you needed. But Susan left her apartment and left all of her belongings, including her wallet, ID, pager, keys. Yeah. Everything. Her med- uh, medication and everything. Everything, everything you use. Mm-hmm. It's kind of crazy. Now, Susan had a friend. Her name was Melissa Hine. Mm-hmm. And she became concerned when Susan failed to return a page that afternoon like she normally would. Said she would return them pretty quick. Yeah. Well, she probably could run downstairs and call when mm-hmm. something like that would happen, you know. And I think when she left, uh, her, her son with, um, with Mark, that actually... Christian was sleeping in her apartment, so that's why I think he was asleep. That's why she stopped and just left, left her son with her, her ex-husband because the other guy was sleeping and she didn't want to bug him. Yeah, because uh, there was more trust leaving him there. Yeah, vampires sleep during the day, right? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. That's why he's asleep. <laughs> so Melissa drove over to uh, Susan's apartment around 3.30 that afternoon on July 16th, and she found it odd that Susan's apartment was usually left open but it was locked shut and all the windows were locked and it was about 90 degrees outside or right. 90 plus outside that day well, i don't know how she knows all the windows are locked doors locked yeah <laughs> unless you try from the outside or something you could access them or something i don't know spider-man climbing up windows but david her son david and mark were not home mm-hmm. when melissa got there but they had been going to staples to buy school supplies right and david and mark stated that they didn't know where susan was Mm-mm. But evidently, there was a pizza parlor across the street from Susan's apartment, and an employee there claims that he saw Susan returning to her apartment that afternoon, the day she disappeared. Well, that's kind of weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the next day, on July 17th of 1996, this was a little afternoon, Susan's ex husband, Mark, reported her missing. But get this, there were no phone call records available from the payphone that Susan was supposed to have used that afternoon. So there was no records, or they couldn't get the records, or there was no phone calls? I don't know, but there was no records available. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. Could they could they pull records for uh, pay phones in I don't know. late that's 90s? What, that's what I was wondering. If they couldn't get any, or if there weren't no calls, or they couldn't get them, or it just wasn't possible. I don't know. Hmm. You would think so, but no, yeah. I don't know. But the police determined that Susan's ex-boyfriend, the one that came by and had a physical altercation with Christian Pepo. They had a restraining order against him, but it hadn't been violated. Right. But the police also cleared Susan's living boyfriend, Christian Pepo, of any suspicion of wrongdoing or anything like that. Right. You know, and then they said that he was watching a movie or something with David the same day of that disappearance, but if he was sleeping, how was he watching a movie? Yeah. And then later, I think he had taken a bus to New York City that same day, about 2 o'clock or something. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of odd, but I don't I don't think it's that far to New York from where they were. But yeah, yeah, I don't think his Christian Pepo guy is uh, had anything to do with her disappearance. No, no, he was just into vampires and stuff like that. <laughs> and there's no record or report of them having any kind of uh, violence between them two. No, but Christian and the the ex boyfriend had even got into a physical altercation one time. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of weird. Yeah, there's a little bit of sketchiness going on there. Some of Susan's friends believe that her disappearance may have been drug-related, and some believe that Susan may have collapsed and died as a result of her drug addiction, hmm. depression, and physical ailments. It could have been, but, you know, if that would happen, I'm sure the, the body would have turned up yeah. fairly quickly. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. The more you listen, the more confusing it is because everybody's got a different outlook on it. Yep. Yeah. You know, like people thought maybe she even overdosed and somebody freaked out and got rid of the body. But I, mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It looks like that would have, the body would have turned up then, too. But I don't know. I don't know yeah. if I believe that. Yep. But Susan's friend, Jill Morley, the one that made the documentary Stripped, 
you know, like we talked about, she had saw Susan listening 48 hours before her disappearance. Right, yeah. Yeah, her, I think, well, it was just a couple of days after she made the the appearance is when uh, she disappeared Yeah, on her uh, documentary. Mm-hmm. And Susan talked about her mood swings and being depressed and just holding on to live. Mm-hmm. And Susan's boss, James Ridgway, he was the boss at the Village Voice. He, like we said, he also thinks that drugs may have been involved. She went out and probably called someone to come and get her, and she went away like she was going to get drugs. But You know, and it, what is weird is it's never really ever said. It always says, you know, to go get drugs and do this, and she might OD, but nobody ever says what what drugs she was on. No. You know, it was like if it, was, if it was cocaine or if it was heroin or, or whatever it was. I've never seen that mentioned anywhere. You know, mm-hmm. what what kind of what kind of shit she was into. So I don't know why does everybody think all of a sudden she just can call somebody an OD. So it had to be something pretty heavy, you know, in my mind. Yeah, but this there's a detective, John Rain of the Nutley, New Jersey Police Department. This is where Susan and Mark were living at the time. Right. He stated that he believes Susan is alive and for some unknown reason to him she opted to leave her family at home, which has perfect right to but right i don't yeah. get that though i don't i don't think she did yeah i seen uh that was this was featured on uh unsolved mysteries episode that i watched he was on there and that's what he was saying he thought the same you know that you know it's our right to do that that's what she wanted to do but i think if she was gonna leave she would have took a lot of her stuff with her so mm-hmm. that kind of that's kind of a weird thing and like we said before i just don't think she was gonna leave her son yeah, he was her world. I don't think I don't think he would have left. She would have left David at all, right? Unless she just thought maybe it's better off without her. Is in a bad mental state as she was, especially if the Russian mob was after her, right? And just uh, separate herself from David. But you know, when she was on the the documentary, it's just two days before when that was recorded, and she didn't really sound like she was flipped out or nothing. You know, still sound pretty intelligent when yeah. she was speaking on air. Like a pretty smart lady, mm-hmm. so it don't you know it just didn't seem like she was she was that far gone. Yeah, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But now, just to complicate matters a little bit, there were several people claimed to have spotted Susan after her disappearance. Yeah, even uh, who was it? Melissa Hine. Yeah, said she thought she saw her getting into the black car with another guy. Yeah, even stopping yelling her name, and then they got into the car and left. Yeah, she thinks she saw her getting into a black limousine. Yeah. And that Susan and the men that she was with got in the limo and sped off. Yeah, and she was smart enough to get the license plate number. How crazy is that? Smart. But they did track down the limo. Yeah. And the limo owner claimed that he was with a blonde that day, but couldn't remember if it was Susan or not. Well, and if she was sex working, she probably wasn't using her name. Probably not. You know, not saying that's what she was doing. But if that's what was going on, she might have been diamond or something this day, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they wasn't trying to. If 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 that was what was going on, I'm sure they wouldn't worry about what nobody's name was. Yep. Now, there was a prostitute in Newark, New Jersey. And she says that Susan took her into her apartment and told her details of her life that had not been released to the public. And several prostitutes were apparently able to pick Susan out of a lineup as a prostitute who was working the streets of New York. Hmm. <laughs> well, as I told you before, when I watched the, the Unsolved Mysteries uh, edition on this, and one of the way they, the way they were portraying her as a dancer, if she was, that has got to be the worst stripper moves I've ever seen any <laughs> actor make. She probably wasn't making any money. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. That was, it, was, it was pretty sad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. But many of Susan's friends in stripping industry believe that Susan was a victim of the Russian mob because of her Village Voice article on the, you know, the girls coming in from Russia. Right, but this is almost, well, it was like a year after the, the article had come out to when she disappeared, right? Yeah. So, you know, it could be, but you just don't think they would have waited that long. Mm-hmm. But who knows? And, well, Melissa Hine even says that when they were together, she thought that they were being followed. Yeah, well, I'm saying that this is not true. Mm-hmm. To mess with the mob is not, not smart. Especially thing. the Russian mob, man. Right. Now, many believe that Susan could have been a victim of a jealous lover like or an ex lover, yeah. Like the guy come in and beat up Christian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, could be. You know, working in this uh, in this line of work, shall we say, there could be a whole lot of stuff going on. I'm sure they always have some creepsters, you know, following around and I don't know. You know they do. Especially in a big city. Mm hmm. 
is going to be a, a whole lot of opportunities for stuff to go wrong. Yep. But it sounds like that Mark Walsh, her ex-husband, is not considered a suspect in Susan's disappearance. Right. If anything, the odd living arrangement between Susan and Mark sort of makes it where he wouldn't be. But there is somebody that claims that they saw Mark carrying a rolled-up rug out mm -hmm. the day she disappeared. And put it in a van. Yeah. Right. But I, I mean, don't, I don't think they ever found that van either, did they? No. And then later he said, that, you know, they went back, which I don't know how many years later it was, because they said that he, uh, you know, he was really cooperating at first, but then when they went back when they thought they'd have new evidence, he wasn't very cooperative, and he wouldn't let them come in and do forensic stuff in his apartment. And that was several years later. It wasn't was it? years later. Yeah. yeah. When I first heard that, I was like, "Whoa, this is kind of weird." But then I'm thinking, you know, he's probably tired of this shit by now. Yeah. You know, I've done all I can do. I think I need to talk to my lawyer from now on out. Yeah. And I don't blame. I get that. Yeah. Yeah, it's time to move on, I guess. Yeah. Now, some people believe that Susan left the apartment for some normal activity and decided to commit suicide. I don't buy that. Either. No, I don't buy that at all. No, I don't know what happened to the lady, but I don't. I don't think she killed herself. Not on purpose. Yeah. If she's into some heavy drugs, that could have happened. But I still would believe that you know, she would have turned up. I don't think it's that easy to to hide a body for that long. Now, there's one thing I want to talk about too, Dale. There was a calendar. Yes. That was in Susan's apartment. Yeah, wall calendar. Yeah, and the police confiscated this calendar because Susan wrote all of her. Um, I guess activities that she was going to do or things she had to keep up with. I guess like we use on our phone today, right. a calendar. She wrote her, you know, her appointments on this calendar. Well, the police confiscated this calendar, and I don't think at the time they realized it. It was a while later. Yeah, that the month of July was torn out. Right, the whole the whole page. Yeah, I don't know if it was a flip wall calendar or what. Yeah. And you and I talked about this off the air before we recorded. I just wonder if they were able to check the month of August to see if it was impressions right. on that, you know, the where it goes through the paper. Yeah, you would think so. You'd think they would you know, you'd think they would look for it. Mm hmm You know, that's a pretty smart observation because, you know, they didn't find this out, wasn't it, years later? Yeah. Before when they went back and was re uh, going over stuff again and, and then realized that that page was missing. But, yeah, like you said, it looks like they could have went in and, check for impressions and do a whatever you call that test to do mm -hmm. and see what was written there. i just wonder if i could pull fingerprints off of it because nobody just normally goes in and touches a calendar right no good questions yeah, yeah. good questions but just wondering what was on that calendar right on that month something for did, sure did she pull that page out or did she rip it off herself and take it with her or did somebody else yeah and if susan made a phone call that day on july 16th who did she call right yeah, it's just some so many unanswered questions. And did the pizza shop employee really see Susan re-enter the building? Right. That's kind of odd. Which I guess, you know, she was a she's a pretty lady, you know, and I'm sure if, if she like she lived there, she'd been over there several times, and so I'm sure whoever was working there knew who she was and what mm -hmm. she looked like. But it's kind of odd that they would notice. Yeah, I saw her going back in her building about this, unless they were taking a break or something, you know. Yeah. Sitting outside or whatever. But Susan's last work was her contributions to a book called Red Light Inside the Sex Industry. Yeah, and, that was the book I was talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. and this was uh, by James Ridgway and Sylvia Platchy. Yeah, she's a... She was the primary researcher right. for the book. Yes. And she also contributed photos and personal writings mm -hmm. for this book about a month before her disappearance. Right. But uh, everything I heard from Jill Morley, she said that susan was an excellent mother a loving and caring human being and just a great person mm -hmm. so we left a lot of questions behind yep and just a note too that all of susan's writing she actually uh even wrote for a pornographic magazine screw right and it was owned by al goldstein and i think uh she was involved in a relationship with him and dis well, I think it broke it off just a couple months before she disappeared. Yeah, I think it was just like a couple of weeks actually. Oh, was it? Was it that long? Yeah. Hmm. So she was doing anything and everything to make money, to survive. Yep. And support her son. And always trying to write. Yeah. It always goes back to that, you know. Mm hmm. That was her passion. Yeah. But if anybody has any information on Susan Walsh, they can contact their local law enforcement and give a tip. Yep, because uh, there sure is not many, not many answers out there. 
it's a whole lot of questions, you mm-hmm. know, and it's just crazy. I don't, you know, why would she leave all that stuff back, you know, at home if she wasn't coming back? Yep, especially anybody in Nutley, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. That was the place she was last seen. Right. All right, Dale, we're going to get out of here. Okie doke. Let's do it. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is The The Crack Crack House House Chronicles. Chronicles.